Um, yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Everal Hussain, and I work with the World Health Organization as a senior communication advisor consultant um, with the programs dealing with COMBI, which stands for Communication for Behavioral Impact in Geneva. But most of my work is in uh, different countries working with ministries of health and uh, ministries of education. The, 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 the strategy that we talk about in this thing called COMBI, which uh, we developed uh, at New York University to begin with, and then WHO took it on in 2000, it's all based on some concepts from, from marketing, uh, and particularly the more recent uh, um, view of marketing as integrated marketing uh, communication. And what, what let me personalize this. What I say is that, that the same way we make decisions about, about uh, even trivial uh, products like uh, soft drinks and, and bottled water and, and so on, um, I would argue that, that everyone makes those decisions in pretty much the same way with regard to very important issues. Um, and regardless of where they are in the economic uh, um, um, you know, hierarchy, so when I look at the, the, the very poor, um, and I think back about my own family, which, and they were very poor, um, my mother made the same sort of consumer decision about whether to spend money on frozen chicken wings, which had just come to the village, and was an absolute delight for her, uh, versus buying fish, which the local fishermen would have bought in from the nearby sea. And as I look back at my, my parents' decisions about things, I realize they're doing it the same way that, uh, that all consumers do. So, uh, so I, I love to have a discussion with colleagues about d do the poor, when I go to a poor village and I see bottles of Pepsi and bottles of Coca-Cola, and I say, well, who is buying that? Well, it's not the rich in the poor communities, the poor making that decision. Now, they don't necessarily buy Coca-Cola and Pepsi every day. But when they do make that decision, I say they're making it for pretty much the same reasons that the upper income groups would, would do. Now, in marketing, there's this new view of, 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 or a new way of looking at marketing. We talk about, uh, we, we need to make a connection between what we are offering the consumer and something that the consumer already needs or want or desire. And we argue that we can't create that need or that want, we can stimulate what's already there. So I say, well, immediately we think about the higher income groups and say, well, we can stimulate some of the, the desires that they have. Um, but I then look at the poor, um, the, the bottom of the ladder, as you wish, and I say, but, but they also have innate needs and desires and wants. And when we make them an offer, we can still tap into that. Uh, we can stir it. It's, it might be down uh, latent in their gut, but we, we can bring that up to the top of their mind. But another important thing about, about this concept of marketing is that we say every decision we make, and, and one can argue about this, we make those decisions based on a calculation. And the calculation is, how much is this going to cost me? And what's the value to me? Now, people talk about cost versus benefits, but I tend not to focus on the benefits part sort of in isolation. I argue everything has benefits. The question is, are those benefits of value to that particular individual? And the value has to be connected to something that individual desires or want or need. The cost, however, usually when we use the word cost, we think about price, and we think about money. But th this new way of looking at marketing says, no, cost includes time, effort. Uh, there's sometimes a psychological effort in, in carrying out certain behaviors, and particularly in the kind of work that we do in the public sector social development, um, time and effort is of considerable worth. So I always say look at how all of us make our decisions about anything, whether we're going to get married, go to church on Sunday, uh, um, go to work in the morning. We always do it, how much is this going to cost me? Time, effort, sometimes money, what's the value to me? 
And I say, even among the poor. You know, sometimes when I look at the poor, I, 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 they, they, they are, this might be a harsh um, judgment, but they're like two categories of poor people. And I say there's the resigned poor, and then there's the struggling poor. The struggling poor want to get out of poverty. They, they want to go up that one little extra step. Yeah? But, but they're striving to do that. And they've got needs and wants and desires, and want, I therefore say one can sell to them. And in the private sector, you will notice that uh, 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 there's a much greater effort to sell small little packages of things to the struggling poor. The resigned poor, you can't sell them anything. The resigned poor, in fact, the obligation of the society and the state is to take care of the resigned poor. Nothing motivates them. They have simply given up. And they are, there is that sector of the society. So if, when one is looking at the poor, I say, well, I'm not going to, to struggle too much with, with the resigned poor. I, I feel that's much more now a state obligation and the rest of the society to, to take care of that sector. But when I look at the struggling poor, those who are aspiring, those who are working, those who just want to take that one other step, I say we can sell them things, so small packages. Certain level of aspiration exactly. Them. Now, it, it may not be the grand aspiration of those in the upper income group, but they are aspirations nevertheless. They have interests and needs related to their children, the welfare of the children, their own welfare. Um, and one can appeal to those things which already exist in their aspirations to use to use that word. So the, the same sort of thinking that marketing people carry out with regard to those we think have purchasing power, yeah. I tend to take that same approach and say, even among the poor, there is purchasing power, but I, but I treat purchasing power in a different way. Yeah? So the choice to, to you know, put your child under a, mos a mosquito net, to get the mosquito net, you probably could get the mosquito net free but there's time and effort involved in hanging the mosquito net, time and effort involved in getting your under five children under the mosquito net. And, and similar to some of the themes you're discussing at this, this conference, um, the business of hand washing, where we say, well, that should be fairly inexpensive. I mean, it's just water and soup. But getting water and getting soup is an expensive, or can be an expensive set of items. And the time and effort it takes to wash your hands uh, the way it's recommended is kind of silly, you know, wash your hands six times a day and sing happy birthday to yourself twice. Uh, um, but but I even if you forget that and just say the time it takes to wash your hands, uh, it, it is a, 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 a cost. There is a cost involved. And the individual will say, well, why should I do this? You know, why go through that effort? What's the value to me? And I think in our, in our communication work, we we don't emphasize enough that calculation. We don't engage the consumer, whether poor or rich, in that calculation. Um, and the rich also have, uh, they also have similar problems um, in making this cost versus calculation when it comes to health behaviors that we're recommending to them. And it's not only the rich that suffer from this, but the whole arena of non-communicable diseases, obesity, hypertension, stroke, cardiovascular stuff. Um, uh, a part of that is linked to the diet, whether you're poor or rich. But even the rich, when the, y you make the suggestion, well, how about exercise three times a week, you know, half an hour every time, they, they do that calculation. And they decide, ah, it's too much effort, given the value. So th the thinking um, from marketing, which has been around for hundreds of years, I say is relevant regardless of which market segment you are uh, dealing with. Right. Selling an experience right. To open right. How can that kind of thinking be applied to charity? Well, I've, I've, uh, after that that uh, that presentation, I've heard a number of people come to me and say, uh, you know, the the way we sell um, uh, toilets, or the way we sell uh, use a pit latrine rather than uh, defecating um, in the open. Um, they say, well, it, our first attempt to persuade people to, to, to either use a, a toilet or use a pit latrine is we do it all from the point of view of the scientific hygienic right. principles. Yeah? And 
it's, it's a technical um, uh, approach to saying this is why you should carry out that behavior. But then when you look, when you explore this further, uh, I use the phrase, if you listen to the consumer and you ask the consumer, what, what is it you really want? For example, the issue of privacy for women would be, uh, for me, if, if one of the few women I've spoken to, is a big issue in terms of, of defecation, in terms of toilet use. But, I, and perhaps there are campaigns and programs which are appealing to that market segment in terms of, listen, you desire privacy. We, we, we don't create that need for your desire for privacy. And in terms of, of your, your, your hygiene um, situation, in terms of your, your defecation needs, if you wish, uh, using a toilet is um, a far better experience for you. Yeah. We're not saying, uh, I, I mean, we could also add the hygiene um, technical uh, uh, components here. But I would say one has to listen to what people want and then say that what you have to offer meets that particular need. Um, you know, I go back to thinking about my father and when he built the first spit latrine in our family, and I'm thinking what motivated him was a sense of pride about himself in the community that he had a pit latrine and he was making sure his children used the pit latrine rather than go to the sugarcane field. So we, of course there's the hygiene thing there, we weren't gonna get hookworm and whatnot if, you know, if we use the latrine. But what really appealed to him was, was this, if I go back to old psychology stuff and look at Maslow and, and you know, the hierarchy of needs and all of that, which the private sector still uses, it was a matter of self-esteem. Yeah, my father feeling proud, he's doing good for his children. Um, and I think if we listen more to what consumers want, and my father was a consumer in that moment when considering, do I build a pit latrine or let the kids do whatever they've been doing? Um, you know, in the same way Coca-Cola doesn't sell you sugared carbonated water, they could tell you that's what they've got, plus a bunch of things. They, they, they pitch that product in relation to something else that we want, yeah. um, joy, the experience, and so forth. And I think we ought to be doing the same thing with toilets. Yeah. Um, I have to think about how you sell hand washing, but I believe if I keep listening to people, I'll figure out how hand washing connects to something that they want. Yeah. Um, and I don't have the answer at the, the top of my finger. Uh, uh, and by the way, even the rich don't wash their hands after using a toilet. You know, there was a recent study that in the US, 50% of Americans, men, uh, do not wash their hands after using a public toilet. Yeah. And doctors, I think there was a similar study, 50% of doctors who should know better, do not wash their hands after seeing a patient, even when the hand sanitizer is there. Yeah. So I, I'm, I think what's looking in my head is your original question about well, how do you deal with the poor? Well, here, how do you deal with the rich and the educated, which, which uh, still remains a, a challenge. But I, I think for us, both in the private sector and when we're dealing with social development, I think a, a basic principle is, is, is the line that I use often, listen to the consumer. And we could call that market research when we're doing it in the private sector. When I'm working with the public sector agencies and governments, I say, let's go and listen to the folks. Yeah? And don't presume we have all the technical solutions. We do have great technical solutions, but we can't sell them only on the basis of their technical value. Yeah. So I say we, we need to take that other step, listen to folks, figure out what they want and need, and then make the offer. All right. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you.